Hello, uh, class. Today I'm going to give you another lecture. This lecture is going to cover chapters three and four from uh, Hot and Tight Venus. And it's very important uh, uh, because in these chapters here, we're beginning to see uh, why Sarah Bartman is still an important figure today. In particular, we're going to talk about uh, legal cases involving Sarah Bartman uh, that still uh, have an impact on the way laws are constructed and understood today. And so we're going to talk about that. Well, first of all, Sarah Bartman leaves, um, she, she leaves um, Cape Town in uh, early in 1810. Uh, she, uh, Hendrick Caesars, uh, you know, the uh, free black uh, who, had, who had controlled her for the last uh, few years, uh, Alexander Dunlop, the uh, Scottishman who was retired naval officer, retired naval surgeon who wanted who saw where he could make money exhibiting her in, in, in Britain, as well as a slave boy named Matthias and another little slave boy. Um, you know, although, you know, legally they weren't slaves when they got to Britain, but, you know, they had uh, they were de facto slaves in Cape Town. But anyway, another little boy who wasn't named, uh, they uh, all got on a, a royal ship, the Diadem, and went back to London. Now, as Crace and Scully mentioned, this is a real high point for Britain. You know, this is really the beginning of Britain, you know, really being in a period of, of, of great dominance. Um, you know, although it would be five years before they would completely defeat Napoleon, uh, Britain had established itself far and away the greatest naval power in the world, uh, Britain had a great, greater reach than any other uh, empire in the world. They had, uh, uh, the, you know, at this time, you know, this is before you have airplanes or anything else. So, you know, your Navy is everything. And, and so Britain was utterly dominant. Now, on top of this, you know, by the time we get to 1810, uh, the Industrial Revolution has been underway in Britain for about a generation. And technologically, Britain is ahead of every other. Now, this is something Chris and Scully don't mention so much because, because London is not uh, a, a, an industrial town. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is really strongest in the in the English Midlands and to a lesser degree in North England, in the north of England. Uh, but the Industrial Revolution has a major impact on Britain because uh, technologically, uh, Britain was more advanced than any other country in the world. And because of the technological advances of industrial of, of, of industrialism, uh, Britain had the strongest and fastest growing economy in the world. And so, not only was Britain Britain a great military power, Grit, Britain was also a great economic power. And so, this is the country to which uh, Sarah Bartman's going. And you know, it's a country in which uh, you know Dunlop understood this, and he realized that. Uh, London being the major uh, city that it was, a city that was a very, very cosmopolitan city, a city where you had people from just about every part of the world living. That Sarah Bartman could really fit in as a uh, person who who would be interested, would be interesting to exhibit. Now, the ship, the travel to London took. Uh, several months. And, you know, when they get to Britain, you know, they live pretty simply. But as the book mentions, you know, uh, Dunlop uh, and Caesars pretty quickly put together a, a performance routine for Hot and Tight Venus. Now, some of the things that's really important to understand is that uh, Sarah Bartman did not perform naked. Now, you know, in later years, uh, people would misunderstand. They'd look at the pictures of uh, Sarah Bartman, especially They'd look at the, they'd look at her you know the, the the cast of her body that that was made after she died that was displayed in the Louvre uh, in, in Paris until 1978 or so and people got the impression that Sarah Bartman was put, placed on display naked in a cage actually that was not the case Sarah Bartman wasn't naked now what she did she wore a skin tight flesh colored outfit. 
And on top of that, you know, she wore like, you know, in chapter one, they talked about the necklace that she had gotten as a child. She wore the necklace. You know, she had a pipe. Uh, she wore some of the clothing that was uh, traditionally associated uh, with Khoi Khoi culture on top of the bodysuit. Now, the thing about the bodysuit was skin tight and it was really designed to emphasize her backside. And, you know, this was uh, the great, you know, the, 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 the hot and tight backside, as well as, uh, you know, what we referred to earlier as the hot and tight apron, uh, were, the, were the things that really, you know, got the attention of Western men. Now, obviously, they couldn't display the hot and tight apron. She would have to indeed be naked for that and be exposed in a way that would be, you know, quite indecent, you know, especially in the times of the late 19th century. I mean, even nowadays that kind of display would only be something that you'd see in some raunchy strip club. It would not be uh, something that uh, would be considered, uh, you know, mainstream entertainment. And so, therefore, you know, but the one thing they could show, even though they couldn't actually show her naked backside, uh, they could put in a skin-tight outfit where everybody could see her rear, and they could observe it. And as Crace and Scully mentioned, not only did uh, people look at the backside, Dunlop... Uh, allowed people to come up and pat a fanny to touch it. And, you know, which is, you know, if you want to have a modern comparison, you can't do that in strip joints now. I mean, if, you, if you're in a strip joint nowadays and you go around touching people, there's a good chance a big, strong uh, a bouncer is going to uh, throw you through the door. And so, you know, they therefore were allowing behavior that would not be acceptable today. Now, when Sarah Bartman gets to Britain, uh, she becomes a great uh, source of attraction. People in London come to see her. Members of the royal family come see her. Uh, you know, not so much the royal family as of, uh, you know, uh, King George's immediate family, but members of British royalty and members of high society come to see Sarah Bartman because, uh, you know, she's really held up at this curiosity, you know, you all can look in the book and you can see posters that were printed at the time of Sarah Bartman. And so everybody comes to see this African woman uh, from uh, South Africa uh, whose uh, physique is so much different from that of uh, women in Britain at that time, uh, British women, you know, white British women. And so, uh, you know, she becomes a source of great attraction. Now, this brings us into chapter four. Now, what we see is that, you know, she becomes such a great object of attraction that a number of people, uh, the four saints, and, you know, if you look in your book on page 85, uh, let me go back here, for instance, and get their names out again. But if you look on page 85, uh, you know, you can see, you know, Granville, uh, Sharp, Zachary McCauley, uh, Wilberforce, I don't have his uh, name with me right now, uh, Clarendon, Buxton. You know, all of these guys uh, were very famous. You know, Thomas Buxton, William Wilberforce. And, you know, William Wilberforce, for instance, you know, Wilberforce University, some of you all may have heard of it. It's an HBCU in Ohio uh, that was founded, you know, to educate uh, free blacks, you know, it was founded back in, I think, in the 1820s. And, uh, you know, it, it was a place where, you know, white men, for instance, uh, who had had uh, children uh, by uh, slave women, you know, if, if these were masters who uh, had an affectionate connection to their children and could afford it, they would send them to Wilberforce so they could uh, get an education and be free. I mean, they could not really returned to the South. You know, most of the South did not have a place for free black people, but they could go there. And so the point is that William Wilberforce, uh, the school was named after him because he was a very, very famous uh, abolitionist. Now, the point to be made is that in 1810, Britain had just ended the slave trade. Now, slavery itself was still legal. All slavery would not end in the British Empire until about 1830, until 1833. Uh, now, you know, we're going to talk about this uh, later on in our book, but, uh, you know, slavery ends in South Africa, you know, in, in, in the Cape Colony in 1833. And, you know, that's a, a pretty big fuss. You know, that's one of the reasons a number 
of Africanas leave uh, the Cape Colony and, and go east. Uh, but what we see is that since the slave trade is over, and since you had the Caledon Code uh, in um, that had been enacted, uh, you know, it was not legal uh, for Kokoi people to be sent out of uh, Cape Town, you know, to other places. And so, and, and as the book mentioned in chapter two, uh, Alexander Dunlop had to get special permission from the British government, from the colonial government, in order to uh, bring Sarah Bartman to London. But the point to be made is that the four saints, you know, these famous abolitionists, all looked at Sarah Bartman and they said, you know, is this woman free? Is she a slave? And, you know, this was a very legitimate question because, as we all know, although Sarah Barton was never legally a slave because the Dutch government did not allow the Khoi Khoi to be enslaved and the British government didn't, I mean, the de facto reality was that as farmers had gone into the Eastern Cape, they had uh, enslaved the indigenous population. And so although Sarah Bartman was never legally a slave, she was a de facto slave. You know, she did not come to Cape Town of a free will. Uh, she did not work uh, for Hendrick Caesars or for, you know, the rich white man that she worked for. I can't remember his name right now. Of her free will. I mean, she had been sent there. She had been given work. And that's what she did. Now, I don't think that uh, you know, Caesars or any people like that had to, they, I don't think they had to force her to stay because, you know, first of all, she was in Cape Town. She didn't know anybody. Uh, when she got there, uh, you know, there weren't any other, there really weren't any other koi koi around. Now, that would change over time. Uh, and, and so she really didn't have anywhere to go. And, and so, you know, even though she wasn't free, I mean, she stayed with these people. And so you have a situation where uh, you know, when she gets to London, Dunlop, he can, he, he can argue, saying, look, she was a servant. She was a servant in South Africa. You know, we brought her here in order for her to make a living exhibiting herself. Uh, but it was pretty obvious to anyone looking at the situation that, you know, she was not a free person. And so what is significant about this is that really this is the first time that we really see the conceptualization of what we now refer to as human trafficking. I mean, really, Sarah Bartman really becomes the first uh, situation in which, you know, modern concepts of, of human trafficking come into picture, where, you know, she's not legally a slave, but uh, these guys look at her. In particular, uh, you know, you have uh, Zachary McCauley, uh, who comes... Uh, you know, he finds out about it. He goes to check on her, you know, uh, towards the end of, you know, in, in the latter part of 1810. And, you know, he's like, you know, is this woman free? You know, is this woman actually enslaved? Is she putting on this performance? Is she putting on this outfit? Is she standing up there and letting uh, people rub her backside of her own free will? And so when he gets there, you know, he questions Hendrick Caesars. Now, you know, Caesars, of course, speaks English. He doesn't speak it particularly well. And H Hendrick Caesars is not a literate person. And so, therefore, I would imagine that the answers uh, Zachary McCauley got from Hendrick Caesars were not very satisfactory. But basically, uh, McCauley puts uh, Dunlop on notice that powerful people, people who have just uh, been engaged in bringing about really significant social reform in the British Empire, have their eye on him. And they are concerned as to whether or not, uh, you know, Dunlop is engaged in an activity that has essentially enslaved a African woman in Britain and has a performing, you know, in, in, a, in a manner that would, was not considered decent uh, for the financial benefit of men who have control of her. 
And so what we see is that Sarah Bartman begins to get significant. And she was already getting attention in the news because of the erotic nature of her performance and the fascination uh, with her body. You know, the idea that at one level uh, her black body was seen as primitive or not quite human. But at the other level, uh, people looked at, uh, you know, her, her, her uh, ample backside. And, you know, men found that very fascinating. You know, uh, just like nowadays, you know, in rap culture, you have rappers talking about rear ends. And, you know, you have if, if you go online, you see all these exercises uh, for accentuating your rear end, you know, pushing your rear end out. Or, you know, obviously uh, an, another famous example, of course, are the Kardashian sisters who uh, and uh, who have uh, had rear end enhancement. Uh, so that they can have backsides that look, you know, have more of an African profile and have, uh, you know, managed to uh, take having healthy backsides and, you know, along with self-promotion and, you know, turn themselves into billionaires. And so really at that level, you know, uh, Sarah Bartman really is kind of the, the beginning of this. This is something we're going to talk about more. But in the process of generating this attention, you know, there are legitimate questions about her status, uh, uh, you know, ab about her legal status. And so eventually, the saints, they push, and they're able to go to the court, and they're able to ask for a writ of habeas corpus. You know, they argue that, you know, look, we need to, you know, the court needs to investigate, and it needs to establish whether or not this woman has come to Britain of her own free will, whether she understands the nature of her relationship, you know, with the people who are, are promoting her, and whether she understands that she has the right not to participate in this activity if she does not want to. And so what we see in the month of November, <coughs> uh, Sarah Bartman is questioned and she's interviewed. Now they have a, a man, a Dutch speaking man to come interview her because, you know, Sarah Bartman at this time, her English is probably very rudimentary. And I would also imagine too, that she probably doesn't want to speak in English because, you know, uh, if she speaks in English, um, then, you know, she may not be able to give his artful and answer, artful, uh, artful answers. And so therefore she's interviewed in Dutch. And what we see is that by the 28th of November, it has been ruled that Sarah Bartman is there of her own free will, that, you know, she's willingly participating in this activity and that she can be left alone. Now, the interesting thing is that right about this time, interest is kind of dying down of in Sarah Bartman in London, which, you know, is not surprising. I mean, how many times can you really stand up in a skin-tight outfit and have people come, you know, pat your fanny? I mean, after a while, that's going to get kind of old. And so, you know, although they win the case, it's not long after this that we're going to see in Chapter 5 that they leave the area and start, and start going into other areas to, to perform. But really, the major part I want you all to understand here is that uh, Sarah Bartman, you know, although she's significant at the cultural level because of her, because of her image as a black woman and she's uh, important symbolically because uh, she represents sexual exploitation of black women. She also is, is very, very, very important from a legal standpoint because she is the first instance we have uh, where human trafficking in the modern sense of the world, is recognized. And, you know, although she was determined not to have been trafficked, she was determined to have come to London and to perform of her own free will. The legal principles that were used to investigate her condition are principles that still stand in the law today. And, you know, you know within the last uh, 20 years, uh, the case of Sarah Bartman has been cited by the United States Supreme Court uh, in looking at questions of uh, human trafficking. 
And so from that standpoint, Sarah, Sarah Bartman still, still really has a very real impact on how we understand laws to this day. And like I said, that's a major point that needs to be made. Anyway, now that's going to be my last lecture for this week. I, I, however, I'm going to uh, give you guys written instructions, or I may actually give you guys a short video on the kind of stuff I want you to do in your first assignment. Anyway, that's it for now. Take care.